President Donald Trump is now chiming in on the situation on Twitter. I'm going to read this live on air a minute ago. Quote, terrible shootings in El Paso, Texas. Reports are very bad. Many killed. Working with state and local authorities and law enforcement. Spoke to governor to pledge total support of federal government. God be with you all. End quote. That just coming in from President Donald Trump. We pulled it up there. Again, this is the first time he's chimed in just a minute, minute ago. Uh, but we've heard other lawmakers chiming in. Governor Greg Abbott, as you mentioned, Eric, is on his way. Uh, multiple representatives from here in El Paso saying their hearts are broken because of what's going on. We want to reiterate, though, that we don't have an exact number on fatalities just yet. We're going off of official word from El Paso police. So ABC News nationally is reporting that 18 people have been killed. That's information that we have not been able to confirm here locally. Now, I'm being told that we do have our reporter, Saul Sainz, who's here in the newsroom with us. And Saul, you were actually there at Cielo Vista as all of this was unfolding. We talked to you on the phone about an hour ago. What can you tell us about what it was like to be in an environment like that? If we begin with breaking news from the ABC 7 Alert Center, take a look at your screen. This is a live look after an SUV crashed into a home in northeast El Paso. We can tell you that three people were hospitalized. Take a look at the damage right there. That's also where we find Good Morning El Paso's Madeline Audley, who's been live at the scene since 4.30. Madeline, what can you tell us? Now, we just got here for our live shot about 10 minutes ago, and I want my photographer, Todd, to show you guys what exactly we've encountered. If you can see through this hole in the fence, it might be a little bit difficult for you guys to see. There is a group here of about 20 or so Central American migrants. Now, in just speaking to these migrants, some of them tell me that they've been here for about four days. Essentially, what they're trying to do is ask for asylum. We're live here from Southwest University Park at the Beto O'Rourke watch party. One of the things everyone is wondering, though, is where exactly is Congressman O'Rourke? Eric, we're just on the Mexican side of the Paso del Norte Bridge, and I want you to take a look just how many migrants are here. Now, some of them tell me it's taken months just to make it to the border. At the top of the bridge, there's two U.S. Customs agents who are checking for documentation. So these migrants literally see thousands and thousands of people walk past them on a day-to-day -day basis into the United States. I want to thank our colleagues in the national media for coming and showing what El Pasoans are made of, showing how we are a strong and resilient city. But our colleagues, they're leaving now. The national media, they're taking off, and it's part of their job. They're going to go cover whatever tragedy comes next. It's, it's what they have to do. But we're still going to be here. We're working for you, and we're grieving with you, and we are El Paso strong. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a peaceful weekend and a safe weekend. Good Morning America is next. Now, Governor, while business is booming in our state, we haven't necessarily been painted in a favorable light recently. How do you reconcile the images of children being separated from their parents and being detained in our own state when it comes to attracting businesses? A very good morning, El Paso, Las Cruces, and Juarez. I'm Mauricio Casillas. Hillary Florin has the day off, but I'm joined now by storm tracker Nicole Gomez because our main story this morning is just how cold it is. Oh, yeah. So cold, in fact, right, that you had a water <laughs> bottle in your car? I did. I did a little experiment. I mean, we knew it was going to be cold, right? But I just wanted to see how cold. And of course, this morning, it was freezing. Completely frozen. And just taking frozen. a look at these numbers, it's, I mean, it, it's bone chilling almost. Unbearable. An East El Paso family had a rude awakening overnight when a truck crashed into their home. It happened at Wedgwood and Chinaberry just before midnight. This is security camera footage from a neighbor. You can hear the truck's driver hit the brakes as it goes over the curb and crashes into the front of the house. Right now, our community is broken. We, we, we are in mourning. Um, this is something that is going to change the fabric of our community. I've lived here, I grew up here my whole life, just as you have. It's something we've never dealt with, um, but we're going to see the best out of El Paso. We're going to get the most out of El Pasoans. As we as a community have always shown, we come together, we help those who need it most, and right now those who need it most, those 15 families who are going to have to bury loved ones, unfortunately. Order at a breaking point. A record number of apprehensions, an unprecedented strain on Border Patrol agents. ABC 7's Mauricio Casillas captures a chaos of extremes that define the year and talks one-on-one -on -one with a new chief in charge on how she plans to restore order amid the border crisis. It's an ABC 7 original. It's a calm afternoon in El Paso's Lower Valley for Agent Carlos Antunes. I've been with Border Patrol for about 13 and a half years. 
Antunes was born in Juarez. Eventually, he moved over to El Paso. He joined the military, became a citizen, and then became an agent. Apprehensions of migrant families and unaccompanied children at the border reached record highs over the past year, and it wasn't easy for agents. As agents, we have family, we have kids at home also there, and then you see these kids, what they're put through, you know, the weeks of being exposed out in the elements of the weather, uh, hot, cold, rain, uh, windy, you know, so it, it kind of hits home because you have kids that are that age sometimes. But with changes to asylum laws and an increased effort from Mexico to stop migrants from crossing into the U.S., agents in El Paso see families less and less, and instead... You're going to have approximately seven to eight bodies. Yeah, so for a little east of the Broadway platform. This is more common. Yeah, Tim Four, they they're going to be between the wall and the canal. A group of eight adults trying to cut through the border fence. They already have eyes on me. That's the thing, we don't have enough agents, so... Looks like they're going to start running back. What did that group look like to you? Hey, nine, nine, three down here, I'm the thing. People that don't want to get caught, obviously. Asylum, you know, they're, they didn't look... Uh, they look like adult males. All right, they're running back. They're running back. There's going to be a breach down there. This group fled back into Mexico, but damage to the border fence was already done. So it's going to be a path of least resistance for them. Gotcha. And then uh, right up north of uh, where we're at, there's a neighborhood where they're, they, they're going to jump that wand. They're going to either load up on a vehicle, or if there's a stash house there, they're gonna get into that stash house. And once they're there, it's a lot harder for you guys. It's a lot harder for us to identify where they are, where they're at. This right here, miles of open terrain, became a rare sight for agents because rather than patrolling in land like this, all of a sudden, they were processing and taking care of migrants inside facilities. And it was this change in duties, coupled with the fact that we saw a record-breaking number of migrants crossing the border that made things so difficult for agents this year. Exhaustion, frustration. They needed the resources and they weren't getting them. Chief Gloria Chavez was named interim chief in July. Aaron Hull, who presided over the sector during the migration crisis, was reassigned to the Detroit sector. The morale gets impacted immediately. I mean, our agents want to do a good job. Then there was national scrutiny. The discovery of a secret Facebook group made up of Border Patrol agents where people would joke about migrant deaths and post sexist memes. The Border Patrol has, like any police department, any law enforcement agency has it's bad apples, right? It always has. But the majority, the majority of the agents follow the rules, they follow policy. One of the agency's biggest critics is Fernando Garcia, the executive director of the Border Network for Human Rights. But what is unexcusable is that even in the midst of that crisis, you would abuse people, I mean, or you will violate the U.S. Constitution. The activist group published a report documenting allegations of improper living conditions in CBP custody and, quote, verbal and physical abuses by CBP personnel, end quote. My goal with BNHR is that we never are in one of his reports ever again, and I joke with him about that, and he says we could get there. Chief Chavez and Garcia have met four times since she came to the sector in July. Garcia only met with once in the two years he was in charge. Garcia says it's refreshing. She was saying that her mission was to make a Border Patrol accountable, professional, and transparent. And I think when she said that, for us, it, it, it was some fresh air. One change Chavez has implemented is replacing these Mylar blankets with regular blankets for migrants. Seeing the images of families um, mothers with their young children. It saddens me. I can't t express to you how much compassion I have for those people. Unauthorized crossings along the southern border peaked in May of this year with more than 144,000 apprehensions. Then by the end of this fiscal year, that number dropped to fewer than 53,000, which is a 274% decrease, a trend which held steady through October. But I have to say, we are, we are expecting this. This is a temporary decline that we are experiencing right now. Back with Agent Antunes, as we wrap up our ride-along, he reflects on the hostility aimed toward agents at the height of the crisis. 
What's that like for you personally? You cannot take that personally. As, as long as I know that I'm good with my friends, with my family, and I'm treating uh, the illegal aliens that we have in custody uh, with good uh, intentions and good care, and I know that I'm good with the man up above, um, everybody's good. And this year taught him a lot. I honestly feel morale's back up, and if we were to get hit with another uh, influx of Central Americans, we would we know how to react, we know how to handle the situation. A painful lesson to learn in this harsh and unforgiving landscape where agents know what happens on this border echoes around the country. Mauricio Casillas, ABC7. And Chavez says she expects to know if she will be named the full-time chief by the end of the year. And right now on KVIA.com, you can watch the full ride-along interview with Agent Antunez, plus to see a breakdown of Border Patrol apprehension statistics during the height of the migrant surge. Those who perished and their families will not be forgotten. 22 columns of light, one for each person who should still be here. A sobering reminder of the suffering that struck our binational community. One of these columns is for Jorge Calvillo Garcia. He was supporting his son Luis, the coach of the EP Fusion youth team, when shots rang. I remember everything from the moment I got shot to the moment I got to the hospital. This right here is the spot where everything changed for Luis Calvillo. He was fundraising with the EP Fusion girls soccer team. They were selling aguas frescas and he went live on Facebook moments before the shooting took place. Say hello girls. And I turned around and I saw him. It's um, uh, I, I, I wish I would have saw him before. That way I could have taken a different approach and maybe saved life. And on the day the Walmart Memorial was unveiled, Calvillo and his team were focused on life. Ten fusion players were there the day of the shooting, each of them escaping without injuries, but forever affected. Despite their coach being shot five times and spending more than two months in the hospital, the team made it all the way to the championship game. Let's go for loud. Job. Their escape, yes. the beautiful game. Get a player! Don't let it bounce, Karina! Drop back! Drop back! The team goes into halftime trailing by one goal. The girls are frustrated, but their coach knows them. Get your heads up. Get your heads up. Okay? I know you guys are nervous. He eases the tension, and soon the girls are loose and laughing. Hey, what's up, Mia? <laughs> it's contagious, right? <laughs> <laughs> As the second half dwindles down, the Fusion have a chance. But that joy quickly turns to nerves as the game goes to penalties. This is our moment. This is where we show who we are. We already showed them. Okay? Let's go ahead and go after the championship. All right? On the last penalty kick, the team comes up just short. Great job. Great job. Hey, no, don't, 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 don't get your head down. Don't get your head down. Hey, we got all the way to penalty kick. Hey, get your heads up. Come on. Without realizing it, these girls and their love for soccer gave strength to so many. They've gone through so much, and I wish as adults we were all as resilient as they are. They fought through it. This was their therapy, and they made it this far. I, I couldn't be prouder of them. Jessica Garcia still spends much of her time in the hospital. Her husband, Memo, is the only victim from the shooting who remains hospitalized. He doesn't like me to leave very much, but right before I left, I said, hey, babe, I'm going to go because Karina's playing the championship game. His eyes lit up, and I said, is there anything you want, to, you want me to tell her? And he threw a kiss, and I said, you want me to wish her good luck? And he said yes. So once again, the girls wipe away their tears and begin to smile. Even though we weren't able to pull off the first place, we're always going to be first place in our hearts. This was really special to me because because of what happened, we still kept playing. We weren't that type of people that would just give up and stop playing. After the game, Coach Calvillo takes a moment to reflect. 
you saw me, I didn't, I didn't sit down for a second. Uh, until now, I'm very tired. Uh, uh, my leg is hurting a lot, but just seeing them fight, why would I gonna stand down when they were fighting? Also in his mind, the one fan who didn't make it. Who taught you the local game of soccer? My dad. My dad, uh, ever since I was a kid, he, he showed me the respect for the fields and the respect for the opponent and the respect for, for the game. Do you think he was with you down? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah, he was here. He was here, he was proud. And on his arm, a tattoo of the team's logo as inspiration. It gives me the strength to go ahead and continue with my therapies and, and keep fighting. I mean, it's always gonna be there, you know. The bullet holes are always gonna be there, the scars. So this has to be there as well. A loss has never felt so much like a win for the team that had a second chance at life. Mauricio Casillas, ABC7.